Apple's new M1 chip is a game changer. There's really no doubt about that. It offers performance with efficiency such as hasn't been seen before in a notebook computer. In fact, it's difficult to think of any other computer that offers anything close to the performance of the M1 at its entry price point. And in the case of the 8GB Mac Mini, that price point is just $700. Uh, that said, some people do seem to be getting a little bit carried away. YouTube is replete with reviews of the M1 machines performing tasks with an apparent miraculous level of performance. And the comments sections are alive with owners and prospective owners extolling the virtues of this incredible new machine, telling us also that our Intel Macs are now obsolete and that we should seriously consider an entry-level MacBook Air, perhaps for professional video editing work? I think it's time for a reality check. Uh, where do we start? Well, perhaps we should start at the beginning, just as Apple has. This first generation of M1 system on chip Macs was never intended for the professional market. Uh, this is the first outing. The three machines available are entry-level consumer machines. And yes, I know the MacBook Pro has the Pro moniker, but the two-port 13-inch model has never really been considered a truly Pro machine. Apple's marketing department clearly has a very strong idea about the target demographic for these particular machines. Uh, but whether you fit Apple's planned demographics or not, if you buy an M1 Mac, whichever system you choose, you will be enjoying a very well-optimized computing experience. Apps open instantly, the system is buttery smooth, and in the case of the notebooks, the battery life is fantastic. And these machines do have enough performance to do things that would have previously been impossible for Macs occupying this space in Apple's lineup. So yes, you can edit 4K video on an entry-level MacBook Air, and in fact, more than that, it's actually a pretty good experience. But, and there is always a but, should professionals be rushing out to buy these consumer-grade entry-level machines? Remember that Apple hasn't released anything for the pro market yet, but it will. Rumours are already doing the rounds of an M1X chip with four additional performance cores, and if that's true, well then, that would truly be a game-changing level of performance in a mobile device. And surely Apple will bring models with higher amounts of RAM to market, perhaps a 32 gigabyte option. And there's no doubt that Apple will keep improving that GPU. So where do we go for M2? Apple and TSMC are apparently working on a three nanometer fabrication process, and whether that will be ready for the next generation or the third, well, who knows, but it is coming. So if you rush out to buy an M1 now, you may find yourself with Spec MV in just a few months time. I think we need a little reality check. The M1 system on chip does make for a very fast computer that's pretty much unbeatable at its entry price point, but it's not the fastest computer you can buy. Apple claimed at launch that it's faster than 98% of PCs sold in the past year, and I can believe that, mainly because the vast majority of PCs that are sold cost rather less than Apple's machines, and so they come with CPUs and specs that are appropriate to that budget. Many have gotten very excited by the benchmarks, but they don't reveal the whole story. The top-end Intel CPUs that the M1 is edging out in the benchmarks seem to fight back in real-world tests, sometimes edging out the M1, especially in areas where the M1 doesn't have specific optimization. Uh, speaking of that optimization, yes, you can edit H.265 4K videos on an M1. And yes, that's something that many more powerful machines can't do. But that's not because the M1 CPU is inherently more powerful. It's because it's got optimized hardware on that system on chip to handle that video codec. And that same functionality and optimization will soon come to other platforms as well. This optimization of hardware and software is absolutely key to the M1's performance, and Apple has done a good job of making sure that the M1 is optimized for the majority of user workflows. I can't edit H.265 content on the 2013 Mac Pro behind me, uh, because it simply isn't optimized for modern codecs, but give it something like Blackmagic RAW, which favors old-fashioned horsepower, and it flies. I've tested the same 4K B RAW footage on the M1 Mac Mini, and you know, it's a pretty seamless experience. The difference in raw power shows up though when you do the final rendering for your project. 
The M1 manages about 40 frames per second, whilst my 12-core 2013 Mac Pro with its eGPU is getting north of 100. Now you could go out and get a used example of the 2013 Mac Pro with the same spec I've got. You could go and buy an eGPU and a graphics card, but you'll have paid more than double the price that you would pay for a brand new 16 gigabyte M1 Mac Mini. The laws of diminishing returns is a simple fact of life for the top end of computing, and it always has been. Uh, professionals will spend huge sums of money to ensure that they've got the very best performance. And if you do want the very best performance, then those same pros would be advised to just sit tight and wait for Apple to release something for the pro market. I've heard from some people who are saying they're doing heavyweight professional video editing on these machines. Uh, but given how easy it is to find the limits of performance if you go too far beyond basic timeline editing, I question why a professional would make this choice at this point in time. And if you're working in a studio that's investing tens of thousands of dollars in top-end camera gear, surely a proportional investment has been made in the hardware to edit that footage. So wouldn't an M1 Mac actually be a downgrade in this scenario? Now Pete and I did a long editing session with these machines and he had some issues with lagginess and the beach ball of death when using Final Cut Pro on the entry-level MacBook Air. And some people have said we did something wrong, that we got our settings wrong, or maybe we just plain made it up because they don't see other reviewers on YouTube having the same problems. I'm not going to comment on other reviewers because I don't know how other reviewers are actually testing these machines. Uh, but we're not alone in finding memory limits on the 8 gigabyte model. For our testing, we actually used the machines for hours to do real work on real projects. And all we did was report it back what actually happened. I guess a reasonable question is why did it happen? And a simple answer is that I don't know for certain. Uh, we've done some testing, but we've not been in a position to spend hours doing an actual project since. So we haven't been able to exactly reproduce the error. Although we were able to push that 8 gigabyte MacBook Air to its limits again briefly. I want to come back to this in a moment, but first of all, now is a good time to talk about memory, where again, a little bit of hysteria seems to be creeping in. Now I said prior to the launch of the M1 that we might need to think about memory in a different way. And that's certainly true. On the surface, it seems like the M1 is performing miracles with just 8 gigabytes. But of course, it can't change the laws of basic computing physics. A 20 megapixel image takes as much memory on the M1 as it does on an Intel machine. A one minute clip of ProRes video takes as much memory on the M1 as it does on Intel. So what's actually happening here? Well, for starters, macOS uses memory compression techniques to optimize the usage of the system RAM. And it also makes use of swap files on the SSD. Now, swapping is nothing new, but if you're not familiar with this, uh, let me try and explain. Uh, suppose you've got two apps open. Maybe you're editing a photo in Lightroom and you've also got a timeline that you're working on in Final Cut Pro. So both of these apps are using a fair chunk of memory, but you're not actively using both of them simultaneously. So in this case, the system can take the portion of memory that's being used by the app that you're not actively using, and it can write it to the SSD. And that makes more memory available to the app that you're actually using at that point in time. And then it just reverses that process when you switch back to the other app. And because it's swapping that memory to the system SSD, which is so fast, you'll probably never even notice that it's happening. Which I have to say is rather different to the old days when we had spinning hard disks. Now, that's just a very simple explanation, but hopefully it helps you to understand the process. Most people know that a CPU or system on chip in this case will slow down as heat builds up, and we call this thermal throttling. But your SSD does this too. If you work an SSD really hard, it inevitably gets hot, and as a protection, it will limit activity to ensure that temperatures don't get too high. This situation can be made worse in a laptop if you're charging a battery, since charging the battery generates heat, especially if the battery is almost empty. And this is the scenario we were in when Pete experienced these issues. After an extended period of ingesting media and cutting things around on the Final Cut Pro timeline, he plugged in the MacBook Air when the battery hit about 10%. So the combination of all of these things together probably caused the slowdown. 
So you may well ask, if it takes very heavy use to hit the limits of an 8 gigabyte MacBook Air, do you really need to bother with 16 gigabytes? Lots of people are asking how much RAM they should buy in this system. Consider this though, the M1 GPU, the graphics core, is almost at the level of the 5300M in the 16 inch MacBook Pro. It's slightly ahead of the 560X that came in the previous 15 inch MacBook Pro. And that's relevant because both of those dedicated GPUs had four gigabytes of video RAM that's completely separate to the system RAM. Whereas the M1 shares its memory between the CPU and GPU and also the other custom chips that are on the silicon. So let's take a simple hypothetical scenario where you're running an app that needs plenty of GPU power. And let's say the GPU takes four gigs of RAM out of the shared memory. On an eight gigabyte system that leaves four gigs for everything else. Now suppose you do the same task on a 16 gigabyte system, the GPU is still taking four gigs, but there's now 12 gigs left for everything else. Now, going from eight gigabytes to 16 on a conventional x86 PC is doubling the RAM, but making the same jump on the M1 could actually be more than doubling the RAM, depending on what you're doing. Again, this is a gross oversimplification, but the principle is sound and upgrading from eight gigabytes to 16 might actually be more of an upgrade than appears on the surface. Now my advice in the past couple of years has always been to get a minimum of 16 gigs of RAM in your computer, unless you're just doing basic office computing. And I haven't been able to get the uh, 16 gigabyte M1 Mac mini to run out of RAM in any of my testing so far. I've certainly seen it swapping large amounts to the SSD, upwards of two gigabytes at times, but it remained perfectly usable throughout. In contrast, we did find limits in the eight gigabyte model. And as I said, we're not the only ones to see that. Something else to remember is that you need to think about the future. How long will you have your M1 computer for? And what will your future requirements be? Yes, $200 is a big uplift on the purchase price, but you will get some of that back if you ever sell the machine because it will be more desirable, particularly as it seems so many have rushed out to buy eight gigabyte models thinking that they don't need any more. So in summary, the M1 offers mind-blowing performance and efficiency within its price bracket. It's not the fastest computer you can buy. And of course, there are limits to its performance. And when it comes to choosing RAM, the old wisdom still applies. More is better. You can't change it after the fact with these computers. So if you're planning to use any kind of heavyweight pro app, you should consider 16 gigabytes. Uh, some of you have asked me about how much storage you should buy with your M1 Mac, and I can't answer that because every case is different. What I would say is look at how much you're using now and maybe double it. You can always add external storage, but you can't change the internal storage. And for professionals who rely on their computers to earn a living, well, should you be jumping feet first into a brand new platform? Why not save your money for the next generations of Apple Silicon? I've got a feeling that they'll blow these current M1 Macs out of the water. I'm really enjoying playing with this computer. It is genuinely brilliant. Uh, but so are the Intel Macs. And if you've recently bought a new 27 inch iMac or a new 16 inch MacBook Pro, don't worry. It was a great computer when you bought it and it still is. There'll always be a faster computer out there and it's pretty defeating to let that stop you enjoying the one that you already have. Companies like Apple rely on us having that feeling of missing out in order to shift more gear and make more profit. That's it for this episode. I hope you found that useful, entertaining or informative in some way. And if so, why not consider supporting the channel with just one click of the subscribe button? Uh, maybe I did enough to earn a thumbs up or perhaps you disagree with my ideas and you want to give me a thumbs down. Well, that's okay too. In any case, see you next time for some more geekery.